evening and welcome to Word Up Bible Study. I am so refreshed tonight. I just want to let you guys know, many do, that I came back from a much needed rest. I, my family and I went to Florida to relax and now I'm back. And it's really something because the topic that I'm talking about tonight uh, fits into what I just did. And that is every now and then you need a break. You need to settle down. You need to get rid of some of the pressure. But we're going into a Bible study. If you've been following us, we've been looking intensely at Mark 9, and we've been talking about before you give up. And last week, we left off with battling uh, the nature of unbelief. Where does unbelief come from? How do we get ourselves in a position where we feel like giving up on God's word, or giving out, not holding on, or giving in because of the situation we're in. Many of us find ourselves in that position, and it's astounding that it happens to all of us, and tonight I'm going to tell you why. If you know somebody that needs this message, we're going to be talking about battling the spirit of unbelief through times of anxiety, anxiousness. We're going to talk about our mental health, how our mental health fits into understanding where we are in God. And if we don't battle rightly with this mental, with our mental health, just like our physical health, we can find ourselves being drained, ready to give up, falling under the pressure, have no joy, no happiness, all because we did not deal with something that is in all of our nature. Come on, super Christian. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how long you've been serving God. There are moments and times you're going to have to battle through depression, depressive moments. You're going to have to battle through anxiousness where it feels like you just want to quit. Anybody ever been there? You're going to have to deal with moments and right after some victories. You're going to find yourself in a position where it looks like you can't hear from God and nothing is working. But tonight... Let's deal with how do we battle that spirit of unbelief through anxiousness. Remember, our theme for this series is before you give up. But tonight, we're talking about how to make sure that I don't give up because I am anxious, full of anxiety, full of restlessness, and can't find peace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to come to this moment uh, all of us, Lord, because of who we are and the fact that we are fragile at times, we find ourselves wrestling and seems like we're not going to win. We're not going to make it. But there is good news in your word tonight, God. You will help us through those moments of anxiousness. You will help us through those times when it looks like we are overwhelmed. So tonight, God, we thank you for that. And we know that you promised us that we would get victory. We would have victory. Teach us how to hold on in the in-between. Let's go to the scripture. Amen. Let's go to the scripture. Go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. When you have that scripture, Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to read into your hearing five verses that I think will set the tone for our study tonight. Are you there? All right, go with me. Come on, somebody's going to get some help tonight. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone. Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, unto Martha, 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 thou art careful, worried, and troubled, anxious. Again, Martha, Martha, thou art 
careful, worried, and troubled, anxious about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. We're going to talk about battling the spirit of unbelief through anxiety. We found out that all sin comes from unbelief. I don't care what kind of sin it is that happens, it's because you did not believe God's word enough to act on it. And the problem is, sometimes we try to wait until we're anxious to act on the word of God. Then we don't have the wherewithal in our spirit or our soul or our physical body to even get that to a place of peace where we can handle it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that most of us don't realize that when we allow ourselves to go into the sin of unbelief, why is unbelief a sin? Because the Bible tells us that it's when, you, when you don't believe what God is saying, it is sin. To walk in unbelief when you know better, it is sin. And yet, we are sometimes on cruise control in our walk and find ourselves in a position where that sin has surrounded us or got us enveloped in unbelief. So that means that we find ourselves walking around and then we have to push that button, try to get well. Now you're sitting around sometimes it's days and nights. And do you know that anxiousness or anxiety affects everybody? Not because you're not a good Christian, but because you're a human being. And as a human being, you have to fight and battle to make sure that you are okay. All of us have to do it. I, I tell people all the time, when you see yourself going through a period where you really, really are fighting, you know, spiritually, emotionally, and you're, you're just drained, know that for a believer, that is the norm if you are trying to get somewhere. Let me explain that. If you know I'm trying to hold on to God, if you know it's because I'm being promoted by God or, or I haven't given up or there's a sin that I definitely want to do but I'm trying to stay away from it, that's going to cause you some anxiousness. It could lead long time anxiousness into being depressed. All I'm saying to you is God is going to give us an answer, has an answer in his word to how we can make sure our faith our faith keeps us out of that kind of mood, keeps us out the dumpsters. It's only by faith that we can get anything from God. We found out that the only way that father was able to get help for his son, remember, remember the studies we did? We found out that when God came to him, he said, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. He had enough sense to say right now, I must be operating in unbelief, God, because it's not you. Your word hasn't failed, so it must be me. So think about what I'm saying. You now have to know. Here's a key word. I have to battle the spirit, the demonic spirit, the dark spirit that sends words through my mind, that takes away my joy, that takes away God has said. I got to battle that spirit and get somehow back on top in my victory. You remember? When you got that victory in the word, you remember how good it felt to say, God is showing up again. God answered my prayer. God did it. Well, with anxiety attacks, all of you know, and I have been there. I have been sitting in a doctor's office fighting anxiousness over what the diagnosis was going to be. I have been sitting or going somewhere, and what I had to do, the tasks that were multiplied, made me anxious. You say, Pastor, that's not a good, you know, confession for a pastor. Yes, it is. Because what I'm telling you is I had to fight my way through these situations so I could be blessed. And the Word of God tells us about many, many believers. We're going to end up and talk about Martha. But I just want you to see how prevalent this spirit is and how it attacks even the keenest, the strongest believers God had. I don't want you to feel in some kind of way like I must be, you know, I must be going crazy or I must be losing my mind or I must not be strong enough. No, everybody. 
Don't let them fool you. Has gotten to the point, and the only way they're surviving is if they got enough word in them to survive that 24 hours. Then you survive the next 24 hours. Come on, somebody talk back to me in the chat. Then you survive the next 24 hours until you get to the place where then you can look back and say, God has done it again. But let me tell you about some folks. Job. Now, we look at Job. At the end of Job, Job got double. We understand that. We see through Job, Job didn't curse God. But there was a moment in the dialogue between Job and his friends where he definitely was anxious. And if you look at Job chapter 2, verse 1, I'm going to throw these together. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11, and you go through, here's what the Bible says that Job did. Even though he was trusting God, he lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his substance. Here's what Job was doing. The situation, come on. Any of us would be anxious sitting around and all of a sudden, I don't care how saved you are, if right now your house burned down, your children died, your bank account went, you just lost everything, don't tell me you're going to sit there as this paragon of faith. All of us then would have to go reaching and bring our faith back. But look what Job said. The Bible tells us, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day he was born. Job 2 and 2 and 1. Look what he said. Why given to him who suffers and a life to the bitter soul who long for death, but there is a note. They exalt when they find grace. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I am not at rest, but turmoil comes. Look what Job said. I am not at ease. You're Job. I am not quiet. I'm not at rest. How many times can you, maybe there's somebody I'm talking to tonight, learn this word. Job was saying, while I was battling my unbelief, that spirit of unbelief, because I was trying to hold on to God. I didn't want to believe God had cursed me. I didn't want to believe God was letting this happen to me for no avail. I did not want to believe that the God who loves me was treating me this way. So Job said, I was battling, but at the same time, I was full of anxiety. I was anxious. I was nervous. I was depressed. I didn't know what to do. Job, Jonah is another one. If you go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 3, Jonah is a, a, a very quizzical character because what happened with Jonah is Jonah was sent to go to Nineveh and went to Tarsus. We know that, right? Because he did not want God to forgive. And so when Jonah didn't want God to forgive, he did not go and deliver the message that God gave him to deliver. Finally, Job went to deliver the message. Uh, there was salvation come, and then all of a sudden, we see the book ends in a very troubling way, which just kind of justifies or, or brings to pass the prophecy that Jonah had. Look what Jonah said in Jonah 4 and 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I pray thee, my life for me, from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah had repented. He'd been taken out of the well. He had gone on and, and, and pronounced blessings. And all of a sudden, Jonah found himself in a position where he had a nerve to tell God, go ahead and, and um, take my life. And the only reason he was like that is because he didn't rejoice in the love God had for the Ninevites. He didn't like the fact of what God did. But he put himself in that position through unbelief. He just did not believe that a righteous God would actually save such vicious people. Uh, can I park here and tell you this? That's none of your business who God saves. And you really can't prophesy who God he saved. You didn't. You can't even sit there and say, even though you know the outside of someone, you don't know the heart that's pulsating within that God knows. And so God knows who he saves and that's God's business. But the only thing you're concerned about is you do know God saved evil people, right? Hello. I know he does because he saved me. And my heart was evil. And then we got to look at one of God's best, David. Now, you know this already. David in Psalms 42 starts out magnificently. Uh, my heart panted after the water broke. My, so my, after the water, after the deer panted after the water broke. So my pan, my heart panted after the Lord. And then we go down to verse 5, because he also talked about, God, where are you? And then in verse 5, David says this. 
Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Ever been there? I have. Ever had a point where you wondered there was really nothing going on, but there was a culmination of things, and you know, you had just made all these great confessions about who you were, and the blessings were coming, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, problems started cropping up with your money, with your children, with your health. And all of a sudden, I mean, you still are, you know, you're casting down imaginations and you're speaking that word, but the reality is you still have to process what's going on in your life. You know what I'm talking about? So what he said was, man, why is my soul so down? I got God. I'm full of Holy Ghost. I'm saved. My brother, my sister, that is good, but here is the reality. You still have to battle. Somebody put that down. You still have to battle. Write that on your own notes. I tell myself, no matter how many victories I have, no matter how good things look or how bad things look, how many know I still have to battle. I never take myself out of battle mode. Now listen to what I'm saying when I say that. I rest, but even in my rest, the Bible said I got to watch as well as pray. Even when I'm taking a vacation, the devil will take, the enemy will take any chance to mess your life up. Your flesh will take any door you open it and try to get you to go through it. You got to realize that you have to learn that you still have to fight. Here's what David said. I don't even understand why my soul is cast down. I got the Lord. You know, why is it so hard? Why am I so anxious? And then he said, well, yet I will praise him. For my help comes from his confidence. So David knew when he said, yeah, I pray, you know what you're saying? But I'm going to keep on battling. Wow. I'm going to keep on battling. I don't feel like fighting. I, I don't feel like it. I, God, I don't feel nothing. God, it's not right. But I'm going to keep on battling. Last one, and you know this one. We talk about this. Elisha is so, such an enigma in Scripture. Because Elisha one time can call down the, he can actually, we saw him call down the anointed power of God. He was so in touch with God that he called down fire from heaven. That he did it with sarcasm and he did it with confidence and he did it standing up for God, knowing how good God was. And yet one rebuke from Jezebel made him go to the point that he said in his own words, he said, I've had enough. First Kings 19, look what Elisha did. It messed me up. But he himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness, he walked into the wilderness. Don't make me preach that. He had, get out the wilderness. Somebody do that. Get out. You're not supposed to walk into the wilderness. But when you're battling anxiety, you might find yourself there. He walked into the wilderness because somehow... He had given in. He had given up when he heard the word of Jezebel. You know the story, don't you? I know I got some Bible folk listening to me. You know he destroyed the prophets of Baal. Jezebel came back, said, I'm going to do the same thing to you about this time tomorrow. And he ran away. One rebuke. You can be doing real well. And one rebuke, one false problem, one circumstance, and you forget all the victory. You forget all the joy. You forget God's power. I, you, if you don't battle, if you don't make yourself understand there's a spirit coming against me, trying to take me out of who I am, then you'll never battle and get the blessing that you need. Look, wait, can I say this? Please don't get caught up in who you is. And please don't get caught up in what you have. And please don't get caught up in what you already did. No, what you have to remember is what I have to do today to get through this. It could be the day that I fall off the cliff. I didn't fall off yesterday, but the day I could fall off that cliff. First Kings 19, 4 says, but he himself went a day's journey to the wilderness and came and sat down under the juniper tree. And he requested of himself that he might die. What am, I, what am I telling you? Is that we have to understand that if these folk could go through this kind of pressure, so can we. So let's look at our text. Go to our text. We talked about Jonah. We talked about Job. We talked about Elijah. We talked about David. Let's look at this text and the beauty of the text because it says now it came to pass verse 38 you're looking at it as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him unto her house having dinner and wanted everything right oh and there's a lot in there 
wanted dinner, was having dinner for Jesus, serving him dinner, inviting Jesus over, because we know several things about Martha. She, in the scripture, we know she was a good friend of Jesus Christ. They were, they were in a relationship. She had a friendship relationship that Jesus endeared himself to Martha and her sister Mary and their brother Lazarus. There's a special relationship between Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Wow. That's what makes this so tough because some of you have, I mean, a deep, deep, deep relationship with God but can still slip into a chasm of darkness. You'll find yourself slipping and you'll wonder why my relationship with God, why he isn't rescuing me and holding me up. Let's find out what Martha did. Because first you got to find out that Martha is only talked about three times in scripture. This is the first time we see Martha here in this text when we're dealing with the fact that she was overwhelmed about dinner. Next time we see Martha is in John 11 when we find out that right after Lazarus has died, and then in John 12, we see where Martha was serving. And when Martha was serving, at this time, uh, in chapter 12, we find out that that's when Mary washed Jesus' feet with her hair, put the perfume on it. And so this time, Martha wasn't overcome with the worry and the anxiousness. But we see in this first scene that Martha was having dinner with Jesus, serving Jesus, and look what it says in verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So, I like what it says, so you understand. Many of us read this text and think Mary was just lazy doing nothing. That's not what the text says. That's what the word says. And she also sat at Jesus' feet. That means Mary had been working. Mary had been cooking, she had been cleaning, she had been doing the things that she needed to do. And yet, there was a moment when Mary said, whoa, I need to hear from Jesus. The text tells us that Mary was not lazy, Mary had helped out, but there was a moment when Mary said, right now my spirit needs God. I don't mean to talk, you know, I, if anybody, I do not like lazy people. But I also don't like people or don't like people who complain about God not showing up when you won't take the time to turn away when you hear the Spirit of God calling and get the strength and the help you need. Think about what I'm saying. Many, many times, stuff could have been avoided if you were to turn the TV off and open your Bible. If you were to roll down the road and start reading your word. If you were to listen to the voice of God instead of the other negative voices, if you would have stopped yourself and said, you know what, I need to hear from God. I don't need to hear this. I want you to get this picture. Can you see Mary? Mary got an apron on. I mean, Martha got an apron on in the oven. She got the mac and cheese. She done pulled out, you know, the chicken and the greens is sitting there. And all of a sudden, somebody still got to set the table. She runs to the closet. She grabs all the dishes. She starts setting the table. Mary had to sweep the floor and maybe put the desserts up. And on this time, Mary shot into the living room because Jesus was about to speak. He was about to teach. And Mary said, I'm going to do that. Martha then got so anxious, so worked up. That when she saw what happened, look at verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, now the word cumbered means she was burdened with the serving. This goes to talk about in the reality of life, you are going to have to carry your own burden. I hate to say it this way, but you're going to have to understand she was covered about with that. I don't know what else was going on in her life, but this serving had just overwhelmed her. It was like the straw that broke the camel's back. She was tired of running around. Then she looked, you know, and, and the text said she wanted everything right. She was a perfectionist. Many, many times I've gotten in trouble in my relationships with people because I spoke to them when I was irritated and irritable. Oh, I'm 
talking to somebody right now. I was irritable. I was upset. And I've been doing everything. I'm looking around. And those lazy folk ain't doing nothing. And all of a sudden, inside of me was a spirit. And I slapped at them. Because I was overburdened. I was overcome. I was cumbered when I came into the situation. So what I was putting on the other people really shouldn't have been put on them. But I put it on them anyhow and found out that I now had myself messed up. Hmm. Isn't that something? <clears throat> that right in the middle, you get yourself messed up. Verse 40 says, But Martha was covered about my serving and came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister, here it is again, has left me to serve alone. Again, Mary had been helping. <clears throat> she just didn't feel she had to help like Martha did. Bid her therefore that she help me. But look at Jesus. And I love this. Transition with me. Jesus said to her, in love. He see the face of Jesus looking around, thinking, you know, yeah, we could eat in a moment, Mary, and everything smelled good. I, I like the way the fried chicken smell. I see those yams. I like all that. But right now, I want to give out the word. My father's promises. There's something I need to say to you. And all of a sudden, he said, Martha, Martha. And there's something have Jesus call you by your first name. And you know he said it in love. He said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. Careful, worried, troubled, anxious. It was not about the dinner. It wasn't about the cooking and the serving. Look what he said. You are troubled about many things. Stop right there. Here is part of the key to this text. You're not just troubled about this. There's some other things already troubling you that you didn't take to Jesus. Or there's some things already troubling you that you overlook or you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to address it. And you think somehow, we think they're supposed to disappear and those things just somehow get worse. He said, you're troubled about many things. Jesus calls those many things everything that does not have to do with your relationship to him or the fact that these many things has overridden your faith and now you're operating in unbelief in the area of many things. That's right. You know what I'm saying. I'm saying that even though you're doing this, even though Jesus is there, even though you're in church, even though you're reading your scriptures, even though you got your Bible, even though you're tuned in the Bible study right now, some things in your mind still are saying, God can't help that. God won't fix that. I don't know how that's going to get there. You, you actually uh, got yourself to believe in unbelief that God couldn't handle it. Think about what I'm saying. He said, you're troubled about many things, and now all of a sudden you just snap because the anxiousness is too much for you to handle. And now God's saying, no, 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 Martha, Martha. Listen, it's not just cooking. It's your kids. It's, you know, that report you got from the doctor. It's your health that's getting worse and you didn't go to the doctor. It's those thoughts that you couldn't get out your mind. It's looking at a future that looks dark and you get dressed and you brush your teeth and you smile in the mirror but you still let those things be pushing you in the back of your mind. And he said, Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things. Then he hid. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that thing. That's what I was trying to get in this text. We saw it. Mary loved her sister. Mary loved Jesus. But Mary had enough sense to know, I better get some word or this thing's going to kill me. She might have ended up like Martha. Martha thought, I could just add Jesus in and, you know, <clears throat> this other stuff happened, but not really sit down and listen. When you see someone sitting at the feet of Jesus, in biblical times, that's how people respected their rabbi. They would sit at his feet while he taught them the word. Sitting at Jesus' feet meant, I respect what God is saying. I'm getting ready to apply what God is saying. I'm getting ready to let God erase this evil, this evil thought, this darkness out of my mind. I'm going to let the word of God be so strong till I'm no longer anxious. 
Anxiousness can keep you restless. It'll make you not sleep at night. It'll make you think and not be able to shut your mind down. You'll be walking through life like a zombie because that anxiety and that anxiousness got you so you're so wound up, you can't find peace. And yet, Jesus gave us the remedy. There's one thing. One thing you need right now. In Psalms 27, one of my favorite Psalms, David himself says, that, you know, the Lord is my life, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? I got that word in there, so my, when my uh, enemies and my friends come against me, eat my flesh, they, my foes come against me, eat my flesh, they stumble and fall. Why do, when you get to the part of the text, David goes through all of that, and then he says one thing in verse 4. There it is. Have I desired of the Lord? But David, you just said all that other stuff about God. Yeah, but this one thing, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. There it is. David said, if I can get to the feet of Jesus, if I can inquire from him, if I can get in his temple, if I can get into a spiritual place where I hear from God, anxiety will be gone. Come on, somebody. God is saying this one thing will knock all of that pressure, all that anxiousness out of your life. Just don't keep walking around on autopilot, stop and do what Mary did and get down to the feet of Jesus and allow God to speak into your heart. One thing, theme throughout scriptures. Another one was Apostle Paul. It's powerful, but Paul said, um, I don't count myself to have apprehended. Uh, this is Philippians uh, 3, 13, 14. Come on, you know. You know, this, this is this. You've heard it before. Forgetting those things behind Reaching forth for the things ahead, right? I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but there's one thing I do. Listen, Paul gave us some instruction. I forget those things behind me. Worry? I'm not going to worry about what already happened. Wow. I'm not going to let anxiousness rob me of my joy of the dead by me worrying about what already happened. I forget those things behind. He said, and I press or I reach for the things ahead. It, 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 it's, a, it's a balanced thing. Well, you got to put out your mind what, what already happened. You survived that. You survived that. You already survived that. But then start reaching for the things you want. Too many of us are stuck in the status quo of worrying about what we didn't have or revisiting all the time what we did what we did have. And we're nostalgic about our losses. And sometimes that when you get that nostalgic about what you lost, it brings back those same dark feelings and you bring your own self to a place where you can't survive. Because you went backwards when Paul said, one thing I do, I forget those things, and I reach for what's going on. All he's saying is, I'm battling, and the one thing I need, again, is to be with Jesus. I'm going to press till I get to Jesus. And one more, you remember when the rich one, young ruler came to Jesus, and um, you know he said, what must I do, Master, to gain eternal life? You can look at this in Luke's Gospel or one of the other Gospels, but Luke 18 is where I am. He said, what must I do to gain eternal life? And he said, um, you know, I'm your mother and father. He gave him a command. Jesus talked to him about the command. But he starts smiling. All these things have I done since I was a youth. I've been doing that. Here's another trick of the enemy. He tricks you into thinking that the things you've been doing. Come to church. Check. Um, pay my tithes. Check. Help somebody out. Check. Uh, pray for people, check. So you're doing all these checks, and you think those checks are what's keeping you at peace, but they're not. Uh, the things that we do are things that we do based on our relationship with God, and they should bring us joy and peace. But when the things that we do become our God, we're going straight to anxiousness. Because you'll sit back and figure out something. You can't do enough. That you can sit back and rely on what you've done to keep peace in your life. Here's what the rich young ruler said. I've done all that. And Jesus looked at him and said, uh, you still lack 
one thing. Sell all you have and give half to the poor. Then come follow me. Every time Jesus says the one thing, he always gets us to the place where it ends up with us following him. Wow. He said, the one thing you lack is you have not made sure I am that first place. All this stuff you did, you did your things, good, but you gotta come follow me. Let's talk about this in the time we got left. So how do I get out of the Martha syndrome? I mean, how do I actually find myself battling until I am through with this situation? First, I want you to go to Hebrews 3 and 12. Very interesting. I need you to know that the battle is with the spirit of unbelief while I'm anxious. I only bought in the while I'm anxious. We always battle the spiritual unbelief, but now I gotta bring in, because many of us, it's okay to battle when you're in church and everybody's singing, anointing and falling, we got our hands up, oh God, he knows my name, all that, that's good. That's not the time you need faith. It's when nobody's there, the darkness is surrounding you, um, your, your resistance is, is getting thinner, and you find yourself walking around pretending to be a strong saint, but no, deep inside, this anxiety and anxiousness is killing me. How do I get through it so I'm not walking with it every day? And if the enemy will, he'll try to detach you from you know, your, your, your Christian walk. He'll try to detach that from the things that's making you anxious. He'll make you think, well, that's got nothing to do with how you're going to survive this. That's got nothing to do with how you're going to, you know, uh, wash all the clothes, do all the grocery shopping, pay all the bills, you ain't got no money. Uh, fine. That got nothing to do with your car burning. No, all of this God is concerned. But the devil tries to separate us. But Hebrews 3 and 12 said this. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. What makes an evil heart of unbelief? Before anybody thinks I'm trying to call you evil, he said an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Do you see the theme? One thing Mary has chosen, Martha, you need to choose it. Get at my feet. Paul, get the things behind. Press to get at his feet. When you listen to everybody, you're rich young ruler. You got all that, but no, what I need you to do is come follow me. You got to see the pattern that's being exhibited here. Jesus is telling us that the best way for us to get his blessing is to take that word, his promises, and battle that spirit. And when we depart from God, that's when unbelief. When we depart from believing that God can handle it, that, that is when unbelief comes. This, this is elementary what I'm about to tell you, but when you got saved, just in case someone never told you, the new birth came with battle instructions. You hear that? It did not come with ease. It did not tell you to go build a hammock and you know lay in your backyard while the sun is shining and the flowers are blooming. Look up at the clouds and the birds are singing. Or go, you know, and buy you, you know, one of those uh, those mattresses that go up and down and Fix your head up and kick your feet and prop. And now let your say just live in ease from that one confession you made. No. Put on the whole armor of God that you may fight. Do you realize we forget? Uh, in the Bible, it's called the fight of faith. Write that down. The fight of faith. 2 Timothy 4 and 7. Paul, who we know, the Apostle Paul now, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. We say two-thirds, but he wrote, you know, we, we, we're breaking it down to 75%. But we know the letters that Paul wrote. Even if we don't know the letters, we know the intensity of his relationship with God. You know how he heard from God. And we know the words that he has written sometimes that delivered us from such dark and sad places. We know that just, just hearing Paul, we knew that Paul had to be connected from God with God. And yet, Paul lets us know in 2 Timothy 4 and 7, what was the secret of his making it? Here's what he said. I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. 
Oh my God, what did you do, Paul? I fought, I made sure I was trying to get to the end of my course, not my neighbor's course, not look around at what somebody else got and envy them, not get jealous over the ease somebody else is having. No, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith. Then in 1 Timothy, Paul, when he was mentoring Timothy, told him in 1 Timothy 6 and 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. God is saying many times we have a great profession before other people. We start professing how good God is and how good things are, but we got to realize that I have to fight, and that means many times you are going to have to fight for your belief, for your faith, fight that spirit of unbelief off while you are going through an anxious, nerve-wracking, worrying situation. You're going to have to fight through those clouds and get to your faith. Get back to your faith. If you look at anxiety, so many things in the world can cause us anxiety. Relationships. I found out as a father of four children, you can be doing well. You know, me and my wife, empty nest, you know, got, uh, you know, got our finances straightened out, things look well, we can pay our bills, pretty decent health for both of us. You know, we got our doctor's appointment we go to and we, you know, do the things you're supposed to do, exercise, take our medicine, we do what we need to do. We feel good, but don't you know, let me hear one of my children are doing bad. All of a sudden, it invades my life. Have I got a witness? It invades my life. Let you hear. I'm talking about a grown child. They could be 45 years old. And you sit there and somebody say, it can invade your peace, steal your beliefs. It'll get you to the point that you're walking around anxious. Even So I found out that no matter where I'm at, I'm always going to be a father of those children. And I always got to maintain myself because at the root of unbelief is sometimes this anxiety. Or the root of anxiety is unbelief. Because if I hear something's going wrong with my children, and I've already prayed for my children, I have it, I got to have it. I'm praying for my kids. Then I should know they're going to be all right. But I still got to process that anxiousness. So what I got to do is I got to process the anxiousness by getting back to the promise of God. Ooh. I got to make sure that I don't find myself not trusting God. Because God expects us not to be anxious because he provides. I'll say it again. Write it down. God expects us not to be anxious because he provides. If you go to Matthew 6. Uh, verses 25 to 34, we all know. But four times in this text, Jesus says, you should not be anxious. He said, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. I'm telling you why. Don't be anxious. You know the text, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, when he talked about, you know, lilies of the field, the birds of the air. This is what he says in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious. Verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to your life? Verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious. Therefore, do not be anxious. Jesus makes understanding the root of anxiety is not believing God will supply. I want to go to that text. I didn't plan on doing that, but I want to go to that text. I want you to go with me. Go to Matthew. The Spirit of God just told me we need to see this so you can see that, that God is telling us this right in the middle of some pretty anxious kind of situations, but he's also telling us that he will provide. Look at verse 25. Therefore, Matthew 6, 25, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, not for your body, what you shall put on, is not life more than meat, the body more than rain. Then he gives us why. Behold the birds of the air, they don't sow, they don't have any jobs, they don't reap, they don't pick up a harvest, nor gather in the barns, they don't stock stuff up, yet your heavenly Father feeds them how much more are you. Then he goes back in verse 27. That's why which of you, by just being anxious, can add one cubit to your statue? Then he said, take no thought, again, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
He talks about what they don't do, what they don't do. Then he says Solomon. And then he tells us again in verse 31. I love it. Therefore, take no thought, saying what you shall eat, what you shall drink, where you shall put on. Verse 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, the Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. Therefore, do not be anxious. Therefore, take no thought means therefore, do not be anxious. God is saying, the only reason you're anxious is because you don't believe me. I just hit somebody where they did, but God said, the only reason you're anxious, be honest, because I don't, if you knew, if you believe God's promise when he said the blessing was on the way, then you would not be anxious. I'm going to close this lesson by going to some scriptures to let you see some things that the Bible testifies about. The Bible says what we should do. So the one thing we should do for anxiety is you got to quickly get by Jesus' feet. you got to quickly make sure you remember, uh, regurgitate, and meditate on the fact that God has promised, and all of a sudden, you knock the anxiety out, you knock the anxiousness out by bringing your faith back, your faith back in God. I didn't say it was easy. I said that's the one thing. It's the only one thing that can save you through this situation. Look at Psalm 56 and 3. When I am afraid, here it is, I put my trust in thee. Look what he said. The psalmist is saying, when I'm afraid, which means all of us are going to be afraid. But when I'm afraid, that's the time when I put my trust in you. Now, the way the psalm is written, it does not mean I wait till I'm afraid because that would mean I'm just struggling around with fear. No, I battle the fear. So when I'm afraid, automatically what comes up in me is my trust that I put in you. What are you afraid of? If you would be afraid, the word says that's the time you put your trust in God. That's the time your faith rises up and you get rid of your unbelief. An example is anxiety is going to come, but somehow you have to get rid of it, right? The Bible gives us a great example on how to get rid of it. In 1 Peter 5 and 7, what Peter says, now you know all the stuff Peter been through. Peter was one who could tell us anxiousness. He denied God and found his way back to Jesus. Not only back to Jesus, but found himself in charge on the day of Pentecost. How did he do that? The Bible tells us that he says, 1 Peter 5 and 7, cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares about you. And it does not say you will never feel anxiety, but you got to cast it on God. Uh, I wrote that down. Because I wanted you to know, it does not mean you will never feel anxious. That's not what this lesson is about. But you got to learn how to cast it. How do you cast it? By believing God cares about me. And God will bless you. When you are overcome uh, by anxiety, and you're in this, you know, this path of unbelief, you got to get back to the point that you believe God cares. How do you believe God cares? One of our verses we always use, but I, I constantly use it. And people say, well, everybody knows that scripture. Yeah, everybody knows it, but does everybody apply? I apply. Jeremiah 29 and 11. God says to me, for I know the plan. Since I know God is love, and God said he knows the plans, then I'm going to believe that God's plans for me are going to be the plans that bless me. I know the plans that I have for you. That way, I get, I feel safe in what I'm going through, because somewhere along this journey, God has a plan to do good and not evil, to give me a future and hope. Wow. God said, I know the plan, but you have to learn to trust me. So we have to have enough faith to know what God says. For when we are in trouble, okay, when I'm anxious about my ministry, about being useless about where I am in life, when I fight, I got to fight that with Isaiah 55 and 11. You know, when it looks like uh, nothing's working, Isaiah says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it will not return back unto me, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing. To God said, when you get my word in you, it's going to make you prosper. So when you're anxious about what your future looks like, put a word in you that says, I have a future, and watch prosperity come. He said, when I'm anxious and I feel 
too weak to handle my situation. God has let me down. And nobody will, will admit that, but seems like I'm the one he's picking on. I keep going through. I keep going through. I keep going through. Why God? The Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians, when Paul found himself working for God, constant pressure, people trying to kill him, and then God had a nerve to send him a thorn in the flesh. And when Paul went to God, and he knew he was anxious, he went to God and said, God, what's going on? I'm working for you. Sounds like us, right? I'm doing the best I can. Sounds like us, right? But here it happened what's happening. He said, Jesus looked at him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. God said, when you're weak, that's when my power is made strong. When I have been anxious about my decisions, write this down, guys. In Psalms 32 and 8, when you're anxious about the decision, how many of us have made the wrong decision? And now I've got to the point, sincerely, I gotta tell you this. After all these years of pastoring, I've gotten to the point that when I make a wrong decision or I make a wrong mistake or I make a mistake, I found out my mind goes directly to how to fix it so that I don't lay up night dwelling, nights dwelling on it. You ever been there? Well, you made a mistake, and then you're going to sit there and beat yourself up over and over again. Oh, God, how could I do that? And it keeps coming back, and the enemy keeps throwing it in your mind. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. You wasted all that energy on what you shouldn't have done. When the Bible says in Psalms 32, you got to pick yourself up and try again, because here's what he said. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I'm going to read that again, Psalms 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. This means God's in a relationship with you. This means God cares about you. You got to hear his voice. This means somewhere God has been trying to get in touch with you. He said, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And you wonder why I'm smiling right now. Because I think about those times when I sat up, beating myself up, wasting time. When, I, when God had his eye on me and I sat there punished. Lastly, when it feels like nothing else is working in your life. Battle it. When you're facing, you know, stuff that just, this is good what you're saying. But there's some things coming against me that you just don't understand. When that happens, Romans 8, 31, very short verse, but it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Um, we got any Marthas out there? Can you hear Jesus? Are you anxious and overcome tonight? Or is it got a lot of problems floating around? I want you to hear the voice of Jesus. Martha Martha, put your, put your name there. James, James, you are troubled and worried. You're anxious about too many things. Mary, one thing is needful, and Mary chose that part. I want to help you get rid of those anxious moments. Please, Direct somebody to this teaching. Go back and listen to it again. I tried to, you know, out of my normal mode. I tried to slow down and really like, squeeze the juice out of it. I wanted to make sure you understood that you have to battle that spirit of unbelief. So when you're anxious, it's not you, it's not your mind going crazy. You got to work that faith back up until you understand. I got to learn how to battle unbelief in anxiousness through anxiety through depression, because that's the time when I need to do it. This is Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you, and we will see you next week. I want you to look on the screen. There is our, um, you know, ways to get to the ministry. You'll find out we are a very exciting ministry. If you go to www.shilobaptistchurches, you'll find out that the Word is first place. You're not a fluff ministry where you always fluff stuff. Everything is about the Word of God. This is Pastor Duncan saying, I am smiling tonight, and that is because I know that God
can help you through your anxiousness. God bless you.